Hello and welcome everyone to another market commentary from us at Stashaway. With me, of course, our Chief Investment Officer, Freddie Lim. Hey, Freddie. Hey, everyone. If I haven't seen you um, in the beginning of the year, this is time to say Happy New Year. Uh, wish you all the best and uh, great health and great wealth uh, in 2022 and beyond. Yeah, and our Deputy CIO, of course, as well. Stephanie, how are you? I'm good. Hi, everyone. Happy New Year as well. Yes, Happy New Year, everyone, once again from us. And um, obviously, both of you, uh, we have lots to discuss today. Um, the markets have been a wild ride, right? Uh, I think even intraday, um, if you look at the Dow over the la last two sessions, I think at some point it was down six, 700 points, and then it, it ended up almost even again on both days. Um, so lots of volatility, even intraday, that we haven't seen for a long time uh, over the last you know few months. So with that being said, um, we touched the topic of inflation quite a bit, right? Over the last um, three, four months. And the numbers are still very high coming out of the US and other parts of Europe as well. And same also in, in, in Asia, right? So what's the latest on that? And, you know, where do you see that going? Well, great question, actually. And I think a lot of users uh, were concerned about inflation as well. You see it in your daily lives, right? So um, the um, the inflation story is key because um, uh, people were thinking supply chain disruption was, was the main reason. But as it turns out, uh, in the U.S., core inflation was going up a lot. Um, in fact, core inflation was, last I checked, was around 5.4% year-on-year. And the total headline inflation is around eight. So a lot of it is actually core, core inflation and the remaining coming from raw materials, energy prices, and, and actual real economy inflation. So that's, that prompted uh, a, a sort of a more uh, tightening stance by, by central banks around the world. Um, you know, as you knew, Singapore Central Bank already hiked uh, by surprise yesterday. So the inflation story is key. It still has momentum as long as we are still in this uh, this sort of uh, uh, as long as we're not totally reopened. Um, and uh, adding to that inflation story is the recent tension between the Russia and Ukraine, where. Uh, Russian troops are now, you know, getting close to Ukraine again, and it, it created quite a bit of geopolitical tension where the U.S. is also uh, involved. And that really kept energy prices high. As you know, if there's any warfare, it tends to be a positive uh, for, for, for energy prices. So that inflation team and the geopolitical tension in the near term kept energy stocks and energy prices high in the meantime. So inflation, definitely something that we are concerned with and prepared for since July's last year, where Stashaway re-optimized all portfolios. Um, no, thanks, Freddie. And I think you, you, you touched a little bit on the topic of the Russia-Ukraine tension or pretty much Russia-Western world tension now, right? Because I think all eyes are on this. How, how, how much, based on your experience, how, how much of an effect do these... Um, geopolitical events have on stocks knowing that you know some of the indexes are down you know um, close to 10 percent with you know tech stocks down almost 14 percent year to date right well um geopolitical tension in terms of warfare um, tends to be short-lived um, i remember in the gulf war uh, that there's certainly a, a impact uh, back then on oil prices and hence that translate into a little bit on the stock markets, but the impact were very short lived. Uh, they don't last that long. Um, unless we, unless you have a more systemic kind of warfare, this is very isolated. So I felt that uh, in my personal opinion, um, the continued rise in energy stocks uh, needs to be taken with caution. Um, in the sense that the short term factor can also reverse very quickly. Right. Right now, it's not an actual warfare. It's more posturing. It's more tension. So, um, uh, got to be very careful when one dealt with uh, instruments as sensitive to to that. But overall, markets should be fairly isolated uh, from this. I think the inflation team itself and the Federal Reserve remain the two more significant factors going forward. No, absolutely. That that, that that's where I wanted to get next to. Right. Uh, so, thanks for clarifying that on on, on the geopolitical tension. But as you mentioned, you mentioned the Fed, right? And I think 
what can you do in order to combat inflation? One of the theories is you, um, you hike interest rates, right? And that has been spooking the market now for the last three, four months since it's been, you know, since we've seen these inflation numbers go up, uh, also talk by the Fed, right? The markets have priced in, I, you've, depending on what you read these days, three to four different uh, rate hikes for 2022. So I want to get into a little bit more detail on this because I think a lot of people hear these numbers and they see uh, stocks reacting very violently um, to those rate hike um, announcements. Maybe you can clarify this a little bit more in layman terms. What, what's going on and what do we see from a stash away? Um, you know, how do we actually make sense of all of this right now? Yeah, so maybe um, uh, I guess as as we record, uh, we're recording on a uh, a Wednesday, and tonight there will be a Fed meeting, uh, January one. There's a lot of focus on this Fed meeting given the market volatilities. Um, so for sure, I mean, as as Philip has said, I mean the Fed has actually pivoted um, to to say that inflation is actually top of the mind right now um, since the December meeting, uh, and since then, I mean, basically we've seen the market pricing in more aggressive rate hikes. So um, the market is actually pricing in about uh, four hikes in by the end of this year, uh, whereas the, the Fed, if you look at the dot plot, uh, dot plot, they're still kind of behind the uh, the market's implication. Um, and I mean, both the market and the Fed are pricing in another two hikes uh, for 2023. I think the the market is also concerned about um, number one: would they be doing 25 basis point hikes or 50 basis point hikes at the March meeting? And then secondly, if they will actually start to wind down the balance sheet, which, of course, as we know, has been greatly expanded since COVID. Uh, that directly may affect, for example, um, uh, market valuations, which has been moving up uh, since the liquidity injection um, that they've done since 2020. Uh, regardless of what the Fed says or does, I think in a year where uh, the Fed is clearly on a more tightening mode. Um, if you look at market volatility historically, that has been definitely a lot higher. Whether the market ends up or down or like what, where the returns would be, at, at the end of the day, that bit depends on a inflation adjusted growth. So what we call the real growth, right? This is where, I mean, companies, um, uh, make earnings and ultimately that's what drive the market. So, uh, I think at the end of the day, again, uh, diversity Diversification is key, um, and I mean there are other opportunities that are that are a lot like cheaper um, uh, compared to, for example, some of the major U.S. indexes, which of course has elevation uh, elevated uh, valuations, and that's where I mean Stashway is also looking for opportunities for our uh, for our customers as well. Well, I would also add that um, I mean uh, totally agree that uh, in a Fed tightening year, in in, in especially in the first innings of it um, because it's a cycle change. It goes on, but the first year is where it really matters and it created the most volatility and uh, there tend to be a couple of, it can, it can, a market correction can happen and we already in one as we speak. Um, however, they do not tend to change the trend of where they come. Yes, it's, it's an adjustment. It's a smoothening. The Fed wants to uh, slow things down and prevent overheating, right? So, Overvalued sectors, asset classes will be more volatile. And, and in this case, you see it in the NASDAQ, you see it in cryptocurrency, you see it in a lot of memes, meme stocks. However, conversely, severely uh, discounted asset classes such as China technology has barely moved. All right. So NASDAQ year to date, as of last night, down 13.5% in USD terms. The uh, China internet stocks as a, as a group down 1.6%. So this is totally decorrelated. I'm also happy to say, due to, thanks to diversification and our, our pre preparation back in July last year, our portfolio also only moved between negative half percent to negative 1.9, uh, depending on your risk point for a market that's, that's sold off nearly a, a zero more, right? So uh, I felt that the benefits of being patient, being long-term minded, and being diversified globally is the lesson that comes back time and time and again, especially at this juncture. No, absolutely. And we always preach this, so it can seem very repetitive, but hey, it is really the name of the game, right? Uh, we, we can't stress that uh, enough. Um, 
I do want to quickly uh, get maybe Stephanie a quick update on China, though, because I think they are actually going the other way, right? So they're actually uh, having a more loose uh, monetary policy currently than uh, what where everyone else is heading towards, is, you know, with Singapore already tightening and then uh, the U.S. Ho- probably doing something tonight, uh, tonight right? Um, where do you see China and w- what are the impacts on that? Yeah, I mean, interestingly, China is going the other way around where, I mean, most of the central banks and, and government bodies in, in the world are tightening, uh, not just U.S., but also, I mean, Bank of England or even Europe. Um, China is actually on a losing path. Uh, I mean, loosening path. Um, and I mean, that is a reversal from what we've seen last year, because I mean, China has been tightening monetary policy, as we've said, um, repeatedly I mean, since last year. And then there's been a lot of policy cracking down on sectors like property and uh, as well, especially also tech sectors. Uh, since the, I guess, fourth quarter in December last year, we've seen, again, a turn in their policy stance uh, where they have started to cut interest rates, uh, reserve ratio requirements. And then recently there have been reports saying that China is actually uh, drafting new regulations which allow the property developers to uh, have access to escrow funding. So that would help them to ease kind of some of the liquidity problems uh, that these developers have. Uh, Of course, ultimately, I mean, China's bigger goal is to deliver um, and to ensure that the the the, the credit um, growth actually stays at a healthy pace and prevent bubbles from happening. And that's why from time to time, um, they do these kind of cyclical adjustments. But um, we feel that if, if we're judging from kind of the data that we see, I mean, the economy is actually uh, slowing down and for some of the policy targets they have achieved already. So uh, this is actually interestingly a year where I mean, China will be uh, loosening and also just kind of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, reversing what they've done last year uh, and to stimulate growth. So um, given that valuations are extremely cheap uh, for Chinese equities um, and uh, where like, U.S. equities are in terms of valuation and also the Fed's pivot, uh, it'll be a very, very interesting year for China equity actually uh, to, to outperform um, U.S. I would add that um, China, China loosening is not just monetary policy or central banks. Um, they also have fiscal measures that's turning. So the cleansing of last year is now evolving because in a year where there's what new members will be appointed to the Politburo, the top governing body in China. And that's also traditionally a year where new five-year, 10-year mandates will come. A refocus on growth is likely to come. Maybe this time more responsible growth rather than another bubble to cover a previous problem. So it will be targeted, but it will be about sustainability, right? Sustained growth and even environmental related. So it's going to be very interesting that China, even even some countries in non-G10 world, their policies will be in reverse and they provide great diversification for a global portfolio. And, and that, that's what we believe. That's why we're still uh, look, looking at emerging markets, Asia, X, Japan. We're still looking at China as ways to provide that diversification. Uh, so so that, that will be a great lesson this year because this is probably a big, big trend uh, that's not well reflected yet. Um, but we are seeing it heading that way, um, policy-wise, fiscal and monetary. Um, so overall... Um, Again, I, I, uh, apologies for being repetitive uh, as usual, but we always come back to valuations and diversifications and, and having a financial plan, right? So I want to start the year by telling users that, you know, uh, this is also a time to reflect and plan ahead. So um, do definitely consider those factors. Absolutely. So thank you both so much for all of this and, and for everyone listening. You know, we keep an, an eye on this. We'll be with you again, keeping abreast of all the new information and process, how we process this information uh, to, you know, build resilient portfolios for you. Um, with that being said, um, we have a very exciting upcoming webinar that's actually on the 10th of February. And it's about investing in the environment and ESG portfolios. So Freddie is actually joined um, by two co-hosts and they are Francois Millet from uh, the Amundi Group and uh, Juan Harris, who is a member of Stash Race Advisory Committee, to talk about 
the environment and ESG portfolios that we have just launched. So if you have questions about those portfolios and you want to really hear it from, from the horse's mouth, uh, Freddie will be there to answer them for you. He'll give a presentation as well. They have a really nice chat that is on the 10th of February. And that is available to all of our audiences. Um, so if you're listening in from Singapore, Malaysia, or Hong Kong, that's 7 p.m. your local time. If you're listening in from the MENA region, that's 3 p.m. local time. So links are, as always, in the show notes below. You will also find us on Eventbrite or any other website that uh, features us, uh, our Instagram pages, Facebook, stashray.com, of course. So please sign up and um, looking forward to having a lot of you on there. Otherwise, again, thank you for listening and we will be with you again shortly. Bye-bye. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to get notified whenever we have new content out for you. Also, don't forget to download the StashAway app. It's available in the Apple App Store as well as the Google Play Store. So you can start on your financial journey right now.